Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ohio Huntsman Podcast with your hosts Jason, Jacob, and Jeff. And this is our Father's Day episode. So we talk about some of the father figures in our life, of course our actual father, and uh, just some of the, those mentors in our life that helped us in our in our hunting careers, in our hunting journey, learning to hunt, as well as just growing up and, and kind of learning to be a man and, and how to help out and and help out around deer camp and things like that. And so we really appreciate them. and want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, all the soon-to-be fathers, all the guys that want to be fathers someday, grandfathers, just everybody. Happy Father's Day to everybody. And uh, we also talk about some Father's Day gift ideas in this episode. If you're looking for something, there's still time to, to get something for your dad. Or maybe you want to share this with your wife to give her some ideas. Either way, a lot of good uh, sort of interesting ideas in, in this one. And one thing that we didn't mention that could make a good Father's Day gift, sort of shameless plug here, is we have our Ohio Huntsman Eat Local shirts. So we have short sleeve shirts, long sleeve shirts, hoodies, all different colors. You can get them with a black logo or a white logo, so... There's a link to that in our show notes. If you, if you haven't heard us talk about them before, they say eat local with the shape of uh, the state of Ohio with the nice big giant buck silhouette on them. So pretty cool shirts would make a good uh, Father's Day gift. So before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about Monster White Tail Grub. As you guys know, Monster White Tail Grub is the sponsor of the Ohio Huntsman podcast. And you may also be aware it is antler growth season. So bucks are starting to grow their antlers and a great way to sort of document antler growth and get get deer in front of your camera this time of year is with mineral. Monster Whitetail Grub sells mineral. So they've got a, a loose powdered mineral so you can sort of work it into the dirt or just spread it in a pile, you know, however you want to use it. But it's a great way to get the deer in front of your camera and keep an eye on antler growth and and see how things are shaping up this year if you want to get some some mineral support an ohio company monster white toe grub is an ohio company and uh that would be a great way to do it they also sell deer feed and flavored corn but right now probably a, a good thing to be looking at is uh is the mineral so if you're interested in any of that There'll be a link to Monster White Toe Grub's Facebook page, and you can reach out to them and figure out how to get your hands on some Monster White Toe Grub mineral for your deer. So with that, let's get into the episode. All right, so today, this is going to be our Father's Day special. So, as you guys know, Jacob and I are both fathers. Jeff, if you would listened to the wives episode... His wife made it very clear that they are having kids someday, and uh, he's an uncle, so that counts for something. And yeah, so are you guys gonna be? Are your kids gonna be getting me gifts? Uh, sh- Ella will probably let you play in her new sandbox. Oh yeah, she, she she told me that I get to play in your new sandbox. Yeah, so. you got an open invitation to play in her new sandbox. So yeah, also to see her new mailbox. Oh, yeah. She was excited about that, too. Yes. She took you down there to show you that, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Happy Father's Day, Uncle. Although it's early. We're recording this before Father's Day, of course. So what we're going to do in this episode is kind of a... This is kind of a twofer. Two episodes in one. We're going to talk about fatherly role models in our sort of upbringing in our in our hunting history and we're going to give some father's day gift ideas for i guess if you're a guy send this to your wife have her listen to it maybe it'll get you know if you if you like these ideas send it to her and uh you know maybe it'll spur some thoughts or maybe it'll spur some thoughts for you i don't know we just thought it would be kind of a, a fun topic talk about some cool sort of hunting um outdoorsy kind of father's day gift ideas if you're struggling for gifts so 
how do you guys, I'm, I haven't yet figured out how I'm going to transition between the two, but it depends on what we start with. So do you guys want to start with the gifts or do you want to start with the fatherly role models? I say we start with the fa- fatherly role models, you know, and uh, related to hunting, you know, like kind of sure. the, you know, for, for most of us, um, it was a, a male who got us into the sport. Um, you know, there are some women that are taking their kids out or their, you know, their nieces and nephews. But for most of us, it was a you know, a male. Yeah. And, Traditionally, historically, it's, you know, it's a, a male dominated activity, right? Right. So I'm good with that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think we kind of, you know, owe a lot to, uh, the the male figures that kind of introduced us and guided us you know into the outdoors um you know we were very lucky definitely Um, we had a lot of you know male role models in hunting with our hunting cabin and you know so we were extremely lucky because we had a lot of people that were more than willing to uh show us the outdoors and help us out when we were little. Yeah. So you guys have heard us talk about our, our hunting cabin down in Southeast Ohio, Wayne national forest. So our dad and a couple of his buddies, I, I don't know exactly when this all started. I can't pick a date. I know the cabin was built in 96, but there was a, there was a cabin before that. And, Anywho, long story short, him and three of his buddies went together and sort of made the decision that they were all going to go in and invest in, it's not a hunting property, it's a, it's a hunting cabin surrounded by or close to public hunting. And then we do have, you know, over the years, just getting to know people down there have gotten permission on other various pieces of property. And so, like Jeff mentioned, you know, we've we've talked about our dad. He played a huge role in us getting into hunting. You know, he started us all, right? He all he was took us all out for our first time. That was all dad. We didn't. Some people get introduced by their their grandfather. Uh, we didn't. We didn't really. And I don't know that we've ever really hunted with any of our grandparents that I can that I can recall, but we do, our, our one grandfather has a farm and, you know, we go out there and hunt and share deer, deer meat with him and things like that. But I guess to get back to the cabin, it's been dad. And then his buddies have all sort of mentored us along the way and I guess help lead us into the outdoors, if you will. And so it's, I don't know, I just, there, you think about it and things could have very easily gone different ways and, you know, how do, how do you end up where you are? I guess the decisions and, and the actions that you have taken in the past lead you to where you are today. But I guess I'm just thankful for those hunting mentors that have led us to this point in our lives in our hunting careers, I get careers isn't the right word, but, um, yeah, I don't help me. out. I don't know what what the word is here, Yeah, but you know, journey story. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now that, you know, I'm older and have become a hunting mentor of my own, uh, you know, I've become a lot more thankful for, those people um because now i i realize how difficult it is you know those guys didn't have a whole lot of time to go hunt and sometimes they were basically you know giving up their opportunity to really have a successful hunt so that they could show us what we were supposed to be doing right you know they would uh, i I remember uh, our 
our buddy Tim, it was during opening day of gun season, I think. Uh, we had went out in the morning, hunted, came back for lunch. And, I mean, I was, I was young. It was the first time I ever went out hunting without dad. You know, maybe my second or third deer season. Uh, and, you know, he basically took me up to his hunting spot and kind of sat me down in a tree and said, you know, I'm going to go down the ridge a little bit and hunt. And I was a kid. I basically ruined his chances of getting a deer because <laughs> I was making all kinds of noise. Yeah. You know, I sat down for maybe 30 minutes and then I'm bored basically. Right. So I'm kicking leaves and, you know, and I, you know, now that I'm older, I can't, you know, imagine how frustrating that probably was. But, yeah. you know, so I'm a lot more thankful now. Yeah, I mean, it's like you said, looking back on that now and just sort of looking at some of the sacrifices that they made. I guess for no other reason than out of the kindness of their heart, really. I mean, they didn't, yeah, we were, I guess, you know, they were buddies with our dad. And so, um, you know, we were his kids. And so I, I guess I would do the same, right. If, if, uh, I mean, obviously for your guys' kids, we're, but we're brothers, right. We're, we're, that's a different level. You know, they were just buddies, you know, and, doing that for a buddy's kid is is uh i don't know commendable and uh yeah hopefully yeah. I, I mean can especially sort of go ahead especially because I'm trying to think here real quick yeah i mean they all have their own kids of different ages obviously right um so i mean it's not like they you know didn't have their own kids to also pour time into and try to get into hunting and the outdoors and you know i mean they're the four main guys i mean two of them are older than our dad so their kids are older um so their kids kind of were already past that formative stage i guess of hunting and then the one guy had kids that were very close in age to us um you know some took to hunting some didn't but the fact that they would you know, I don't know. I'm assuming they were also pouring their time into their own kids. Yeah. Plus then, you know, their buddy brings down these three loud mouth, rotten kids and can only <laughs> take one in the woods with him. Hey, speak for yourself. Now they got to <laughs> they gotta stop, you know, they got to step up and take a kid. And like Jeff said, essentially for all honesty, ruin their own hunt just so that we're not out there hurting ourselves, so to speak. Um, you know, I mean, not that we were that bad, but just kind of to make a point or to keep it in context, like, and they didn't, at least if they did complain about it, we never heard it. Yeah. Um, you know, they were always more than happy, more than willing. You know, I've told stories before about how, you know, they, I mean, they taught us what deer season's all about. Um, you know, I mean, just that camaraderie and the teamwork and it just, you know, the deer season or the, you know, the cabin atmosphere that we have now is all because of what they started and kind of brought us into. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. they very easily could have just all went out and did their own thing. And that's, that would totally change the way that we hunt because that's how we would have learned to hunt. Right. But, you know, we were yeah. taught that it's a. You know, it's, we're all here together. We're trying to fill everybody's freezer. And when your buddy gets a deer and, you know, you hear a gunshot on the other side of the hill, you go over and see if he needs help. So what if that right. means you forfeit your hunt? You know, he needs help dragging that deer out of the woods. And that's yep. just the way we were raised. That's the way we hunt. That's, you know, and that's because that's the way that they taught us to do it. You know, it's not who can shoot the biggest buck. Don't get me wrong. We all want to shoot the biggest one, but it's more about everyone having fun, everyone being safe, everyone getting some deer meat to take home and feed their families. 
Yeah, and I don't know, this is another thing that as I got older, I realized uh, probably happened uh, that, you know, at the time I never noticed, but I don't, and I don't know if they did it for you guys, but I'm fairly certain that it, quite a few times during deer season, uh, those guys were, you know, they'd get done with their hunt, get bored or whatever, and they were pushing deer to me you know they would blow up their spot to push all the deer out of it in hopes that they would chase a deer out to me and they would never say that like oh hey i pushed that over to you yeah you know they would just let me think i was you know the best hunter ever (laughs) but i'm fairly certain that they did that quite a few times yeah so yeah and like you know, you guys bring up a good point as, you know, the deer camp, everybody chips in and, and that, you know, for me is even, you know, as I think back, you know, those are even formative moments of just growing up and becoming a man, I guess. Right. And just like that attitude of if somebody needs help, you chip in and help them out, you know, like you can kind of learn that at home, but there's something about like, oh, his dad wants me to help him with firewood or, you know, but like when you go to an atmosphere like that, you're like, no, this is just what people do. This is what guys do. You help somebody out when they need a hand, like, you know, hey, come over here and hold this or, hey, you know, help me carry the water in from the well or, you know, we got to bring firewood in or, you know, and sometimes that stuff sucks and it's physical labor but now i sort of like uh, in a weird way enjoy it yes yes yeah yeah like on the same way remnant you know as a kid you know we heated the house with with firewood with a wood-burning stove and so it was like oh my gosh we got to carry more firewood and oh we got to stoke the fire and oh yeah seemed like every day we'd come home and it's yeah, every day we'd come home from wherever we were, practice or wherever. It, I just remember it being dark, and it's like, oh, no one can go in the house. Do you go carry firewood? Right, go carry an armload of like, firewood. Yeah, yeah. it's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, but now, like, in the wintertime, you know, you 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 pull up somewhere or, or, you know, I don't know, you just get a whiff of that firewood smoke, you know, like that wood-burning stove smoke, you know, outside. You get a smell of that, and it just... I don't know, like, it it just brings back all these memories of, like, I kind of miss that now, you know? Yeah. It, uh, and so just, I guess, being around those group of guys and, and just learning from them, you know, really, I guess, had an, had an impact on me, not just in my hunting life, but just in my life in general, just how to... how to be a man, I guess, you know, I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, there's a value, a lot of valuable life lessons that can be learned at deer camp and in the deer woods and just hunting in general. There's a right. lot of, you know, valuable life lessons that can be learned. Yeah, definitely. And just, yeah, being out there and, and like you said, being out there and enjoying the outdoors and just learning, you know, I, I continue and still, and will continue to learn about the outdoors and just watching and observing and, and I guess just participating in that pursuit in that outdoor activity. It's just, um, I don't know. It's humbling. It's, it's, um, exciting and it's fun, you know, and, that was another thing too, just like being down at camp and laughing with those guys and, you know, just telling jokes and, you know, you always look forward to that kind of, you know, there's the work side of it and everybody chips in and, you know, it's, it's can be hard work sometimes, but it feels good when, you know, your job well done. But then also like the fun, you know, it's evening now where we're going to kick back and, stoke the fire up (laughs) sweat our rear ends off because those guys keep putting wood in the fire and and uh just laugh you know i i 
yeah. tons and tons of stories and, you know, some of them are inappropriate and, and, you know, that's boys will be boys, I guess. But, you know, that's one of the things I remember about the cabin too, is just laughing all the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, uh, and I think part of that with our cabin too, is as we've mentioned before, it's kind of off the grid. Um, it's starting. And by that, I mean, no cell service, we have electricity, but, um, you know, the cell service is starting to kind of fill in around the area. But when we were kids, there was zero cell service. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. had, there was one specific spot on top of the hill you had to go to make phone calls. Now, if you go to the top of pretty much any hill, you can get some sort of service to, you know, shoot a text message out or receive a text message or whatever. So it's not as as extreme but when we were kids down there granted we also didn't have cell phones when we were you know 12 13 years old but um it there was no i mean it was literally you had to entertain yourself inside the cabin with the guys and so you pretty much had to rely on stories storytelling yeah you know this is when i was your age and it's just you, there's a lot of wisdom there's a lot of fun it's just a really really good time and those guys, you know, they kind of set the tone of all that. You know, like you said, there's boys will be boys. There's inappropriate conversation. There's good fun conversation. It just, that's the cabin. Um, but, you know, they kind of set the tone of all that out of, you know, it's like you said, it's evening. We're done with dinner. You know, everyone could go back to their bunks and read a book to themselves but that's not what generally happens i mean it's conversation laughing fun a heck of a lot of eating yeah you know and that's just the way it is i mean the when we were first starting down there um you know our cabin cook so to speak the one guy who was our cook he uh was an army vet and boy did you have to eat because he would fill your plate and you weren't allowed to leave the table till you finished it type thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, that's again, something that it's not as extreme today because you know, he's no longer with us, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, if you're done eating, you better get your plate off the table because someone's going to put more food on it. Yep. And it's, I mean, I guess to speak to the impact of that, right. It's been years since, Stan was healthy enough to come to the cabin and, and be the camp cook and everything. But they still, we all still talk about like spaghetti night, spaghetti. It was like the dreaded spaghetti night, right? He would cook a pound of spaghetti for each guy. And you're going to sit yeah. down. I mean, choke down spaghetti because it's just what he put on your plate. That's what he made. And that's what you're yeah. going to eat. And you know, it was, it, <laughs> To be blunt, it was brutal sometimes. Like, I cannot eat another bite of spaghetti. I am going to vomit. But yeah, we still talk about dry that. spaghetti. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like, I basically like a box of spaghetti. You know, sit down and try to eat a box of spaghetti. You know, the whole <laughs> box to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was every bit of one of those large, thick, paper plates it was full and it was mounded up probably five inches i mean yeah. it was a mound of spaghetti yep and that's just the noodles then you got to put the sauce on it and meatballs yep i mean there's a lot of eating but again like you said it's just we still tell the story every year we're down there for deer camp you know stan's name comes up and do you remember when you know, and anytime we get a new guy down there, we got to, we tell everyone about Stan and his cooking and how much we ate. And, yep. you know, it's just, it's a story that will continue to live on. And that's like you said, it's the impact that those at the time you don't notice or don't realize exactly what I'm mm -hmm. sure those guys probably didn't realize, you know, exactly what they were doing. It was kind of just a, by the seat of your pants thing. They weren't probably at night planning out how are we going to introduce these kids to hunting? I mean, they yeah. were just doing what probably their dads did for them. Right. Yeah. You know, or whatever. But, um, it definitely, 
you know, left a mark for the three of us, I know. Um, like you said, they were the big kind of influences, hunting influences. Um, like you said, our grandfathers hunted. Um, at least two out of three, I know, hunted. and But we didn't really hunt with them. They didn't introduce us. Um, again, not for lack of opportunity, exactly. Our one grandpa had a camp in Pennsylvania. So we didn't get out there much. Plus, with the out-of-state license, and it was, you know, we had more hunting than we could do here in Ohio. So Yeah. And then our other grandpa, we, to this day, we hunt out at his farm, and he's, you know, not of good enough health to hunt. But he still tells stories about, oh, you should go sit, you know, back in this set of woods. There should be an old stand back there. I shot deer out of there one time. And, yep. you know, tells stories about. And it's some of it's kind of humorous because, like I said, he doesn't get out in the woods. So sometimes he's talking stories about, oh, go sit in this area. And I'm like, you clearly have not been back there in a long time because that area is completely underwater now. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Or whatever. You know, you can't even walk through there. It's a swamp. Yeah. But, you know, so it's just. But again, that's, you know, and to his credit, he would be the one out of everyone, at least I know, that would he introduced us to fishing. I mean, that was kind of his thing. Yeah, Uh, for sure. You know, none of us, none of us are, I would say experienced anglers by any means, which is probably why we don't do a lot of talking about fishing on our podcast. But, um, I mean, we all enjoy to fish. We're just generally not very good at it. Jeff's probably the best at it. There's a trend here. He's the (laughs) outdoorsiest (laughs) mofo out of all of us. Um, yeah, but you know, grandpa, he, uh, you know, he's a fisher. He goes up to Canada every year on a trip and we took a trip up there and that's even there's stories from that, that we keep talking about, you know, it's up to his fishing camp up in, well, it was only a camp, I guess they go to a different area, but generally the same area up in Canada, it's way up there. Um, you know, and there's stories of catching big fish and breaking our little kiddie poles and, falling in the water with snapping turtles and there's all kinds of fun stories that came out of that. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, I guess, you know, we could sit here and tell story after story that, that I guess probably mean a heck of a lot more to us than they do to the listeners, you know, like, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about sort of the, the four owners of the cabin, you know, I, Jimmy sort of, he's one of the local guys down there. He walked me, wasn't the first year I had ever gutted, but it was like, all right, you're going to do this start to finish, you know? And he, and he, he was the one that happened to be there. And I think dad was there also, but, but Jimmy sort of, you know, he walked me through it and okay, do this, do that, do this. And he had, you know, he had a little fun with me in that experience and we still laugh about that, you know? And, but, uh, you know, so there's tons of stories like that that we could tell that, you know, hold a special, a special place in our, in our hearts and our memories. And, uh, I guess just my big takeaway is just thank those people in your life that were a mentor to you as some sort of a fatherly mentor, whether it was, was your, your father, an uncle, a, you know, an older buddy, uh, whoever. And even if they weren't a fatherly mentor, anybody that sort of mentored you or, or helped you along just because they wanted to, right? I mean, they don't, like we said earlier, none of these guys had to do that. They just did it because, I don't know, they're nice guys and they're good people and, they just felt like helping us, I guess. I, you know, I don't know, but just thank those people in your life and I guess pay it forward when you have the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank those people. And, uh, you know, try to, I can't say that word, aspire to be one of those people. Uh, and cause you're going to impact people's lives and, ways that you don't even know you know yeah. i'm sure most of those stories 
those guys don't even remember really. But you know, they had a big impact on us. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely uh, for me. That's kind of the, and I've said this, you know, on previous episodes. It's just, you know, it's thinking of the bigger picture more than myself. You know, paying that forward is a good kind of way to put it. Like, you know, these guys blew a plenty of hunt, but as a result, you know, they kind of fostered a love for the outdoors for me. And now it's, you know, it's my duty or responsibility, I feel, to now share that with other people, you know, right. because it's not about, it's not about an individual hunt. You know, it's hard to see past that. Um, because every time you're in the woods, you have a chance of, you know, getting the big one. Um, but it's bigger than that. You know, that you shoot, you hear stories of guys, you know, who shoot these monster, monster bucks. And then it's almost like after that, they're not even interested because they can't beat that. You can't top that. Right. I shot a 200 inch buck and now I'll never see another one in my life. So what's the point? Well, I would venture to say, you know, the point is you're not doing it for the right reasons yeah you know what i mean we all want to shoot 200 inch bucks but if you don't have a passion for the outdoors and for hunting just because you don't have a chance to kill one you know maybe they were mentored by the wrong people or you know it's just it's not about that it's really not don't get me wrong i'm not gonna pass up an opportunity to shoot one that's not what i'm saying um but it's bigger than that it's more of you know, teaching, training, just sharing the passion and love that I have for the outdoors with other people, because I've learned so much about myself, about life, about, you know, friendships. And like you said, how to be a man and what goes into just being a decent human, I guess, or, a, you know, a member of that ecosystem. Right. Um, you know, not just it's not just going out and sitting in a tree stand. There's so much more to hunting um, that unfortunately with media doesn't get explored. You know, they don't talk about all your hunting TV shows are generally the kill shot. And, you know, that's almost the least important part. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of, great things that all lead up to that and then if you don't have that camaraderie friendship buddies you know community almost to share that with the kill shot doesn't mean a whole lot yeah yeah you know, because if I, you're not there's... at camp the first thing you do is text your buddies or call mm -hmm. your buddies you know and so i think i would circle back and you know if if chasing inches of antlers is what gets you fired up about the outdoors. Like if that's your thing, then, then have at it. But for us, it's, it's, you know, while Jacob said, that's like a nice byproduct and, you know, big giant bucks get everybody's heart rate going. It's, it's very much more about that camp atmosphere and hanging with the guys and just, like you said, I, I guess I can't say it any better. Just that camaraderie and, you know, you're suffering, dragging a deer and up over the hill pops one of the guys from camp and like that, that feeling of relief that like, oh, help is here. You know, it's, it's, I guess that sort of, you know, if you can picture that, that moment or that feeling, you know, you've been sweating, dragging huffing and puffing trying to get this deer up the hill and you know up over the hill because they heard the shot comes any one of the guys from camp because any one of them is going to you know lend a hand that that's what it's about you know right so i think let's transition and i guess we're just going to transition i don't have an elegant uh transition but now that we've sort of talked about the fatherly mentors for father's day let's talk about gift ideas if you so choose if that's something you guys do you get the fathers in your life a gift here's some ideas on uh what you could get them if you're stumped for an idea on what to get the guy that has everything 
Because I'll tell you, that's one thing about our dad. Like, if he ever needed something, he just went out and bought it. And so it was like, well, I don't know what to get dad. Like, other than another box of bullets, right? You could always get, you could always get him another box of shotgun shells or something. He was always happy with that. Or he's got quite the sweet tooth, and you can get him uh, candy. That's always a good standby. But, yeah, and, uh, and pistachios. Ah, uh, yes, pistachios. You guys remember the red pistachios? Yeah. yeah. What, was that a holiday thing? Was that just like know. a holiday trend? Turned your fingers I, colors. Of I the 90s? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't see them anymore, even around holidays. I don't know if that was just a thing back then. Maybe now, you know, people are anti-red dye. or uh, I don't know. I don't know why they ever dyed them red. Maybe, like Jeff said, maybe that was a holiday thing. But you don't see red pistachios anymore. Yeah, That's just a fun I observation, I, I guess. I just, the only thing I, I know they used to stain your fingers, but I don't know why they ever dyed them. Cause it wasn't like they were a hot pistachio or anything. They were just a standard pistachio. Yeah. I don't know why just they red. dyed them. Yeah. yeah. Anywho. So who wants to start? Who, who's got a, who wants to start with a father's day gift idea? Uh, I guess I can start. I got a couple here, but we'll pick one out of the list here. So we didn't, um, we didn't put any kind of like guidelines on this, you know, in, in some of our past sort of gear episodes or whatever, you know, we said it's going to be, you know, cheap options or budget, you know, or whatever. We didn't put any kind of stipulations on here, just things that we thought, you know, we as fathers or things that we kind of look at when we're buying gifts for our father, whatever, you know, kind of for father's day. So proceed. All right, so uh, I'll just do the first one I had on my list. Um, and I'm not brand partial. Let me lead with that, but I'm yeah, going to use a brand. Sponsored. Yeah, none of this is sponsored. I'm going to use a brand because that's how people will be able to know what I'm talking about, kind of. Um, but the first one is a pair of muck boots. Um, and that is a brand of like a, I don't even know what they're made out of. They're like a rubber boot, but they're not, they're poly something. But um, they're a little pricey, neop- like a neoprene upper, neoprene, right? With the rubber. That sounds. Right. I think so. Yeah, neoprene cover on a rubber boot or something. Hundred percent waterproof. Um, they comes in all shapes and sizes. The pair that my wife got me a couple of years ago um, is the Field Blazer. They're brand name muck boots, and they're the Field Bla- Field Blazer type. Um, they go up three quarters the way up my calf. Uh, 100% waterproof, and they're just a slip-on neoprene cover boot. Like I said, by no means am I advertising for muck boots. Uh, plenty of other companies make them. It's just the idea of a slip-on, 100% waterproof, non-insulated or very lightly insulated, if there's any, um, boot. It's just good for checking trail cameras in the summer especially. Yeah. Um, slip, you know, You could slip it right on. Your pants can either go over it or tuck into it. Uh, I like to tuck mine in the boot sometimes, especially if I'm rocking tick country, which is just about everywhere these days. But, um, you know, it helps keep the ticks from coming up your pant leg. Um, you can walk through, you know, creeks and streams and don't have to worry about it at all. So they're also good for down at the cabin. We have an outhouse. You know, you slip them right on, and if the grass is wet, you know, you don't have to worry about your boots or shoes getting wet. You don't have to worry about tying a pair of boots to run out to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, I've gotten a lot of use out of those boots. Like I said, they're a little on the pricier range. I mean, depending on what people spend for Father's Day. Yeah. Um, brand name muck boots are between 100 and 200 dollars a pair. Again, depending on what model, quote unquote, you get. Yeah. There's all kinds of options. Um, but that's definitely something I've gotten a lot of use out of. Okay. Jeff, what do you got? Well, my idea is, you know, sometimes it's not about money at all. Sometimes it's more about your time. Uh, when Ohio first uh, allowed straight walled cartridges, you know, there was kind of a, a run on 4570s. They were kind of hard to find and if you did find them the prices were astronomical and uh our dad was looking to get a 4570 uh 
the Marland, uh, what was it? Scout version, I believe, of Marlin 4570. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, basically... Hit, he was working a lot at the time out of town. Um, so him and I kind of tracked one down for him. Uh, you know, and my dad's not super internet savvy. Um, he's hardly ever had a credit card in his life, which is a necessity for buying stuff online. Uh, so that was a, good experience and our dad loves his 4570 no joke we have caught him sleeping with it before so what yeah at the cabin you he the the first year he had that gun he that gun slept in the bed with him <laughs> i don't know no, i don't know he, that that was so much of his choice i think he just passed out with the bed with the gun in the bed but I don't know that for sure. He he cleaned that gun, which, you know, like got back in from the woods and cleaned that gun. And, you know, which he cleaned it thoroughly because he, you know, loved it. It was a really nice gun and laid it there. And when he went to bed, he didn't care to just leave it there. He didn't, you know, put it in the gun rack. He just slept with it. I mean, I have heard him say that he loves that gun. So, yeah, he I loves that it. gun. And I'm, I think I'm good with telling the story is that dad sleeps with that gun. I think that's, uh, I think that's where yeah. you should tell the story. We'll, we'll, we'll correct the story. We'll, we'll ask him about it, but we'll correct if he, it if he does it. No, I think we're going to leave it. If he but, says, no, 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 I, th- I think we just, we yeah. just tell everybody that, yep, yep, dad sleeps with that gun. It's more fun that way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I had, um, have you guys seen, so everybody knows the Yeti tumblers, the Yeti cups, right? I Have you seen the, I don't, I don't know how to describe it other than like the old school camo Yeti tumblers? It's got, you've not seen them. Okay. Well, you're in for a treat. They Yeti, you know, they've got the, I don't know how many ounces, not the real short, not the real short ones, the 12, whatever, whatever those short ones are. I'm talking the, you know, the, I guess it's their tumbler, right? It's, uh, you guys know what I'm talking about? Or am I sounding like a crazy person? Um, I'm not no, 100% I know what sure about. what size you're talking about, but a, a Yeti cup. It's probably either a 24-ounce or a 32-ounce tumbler. I don't think it's 32. Probably a 24. Have you seen my coffee cup, my tumbler? Yeah. That's probably a 32. Exact. That's the, yeah, not that big. I think they make them in both. But anywho, I've, I'm thinking the 24 Yeti tumbler, and it's got the old-school camo, like the blocky... Um, it's got like the tan and the green and maybe like a, a beige or so. I don't know exactly what color, but like, I don't know what it is about that cup, but I'm like, that's just a good looking coffee cup. Like, or what, you know, whatever you can put, whatever you want in it, you know, it's a Yeti, Yeti tumbler. But so again, we're not sponsored by Yeti, but that's just a good looking cup. So there's an idea. If you're looking for a cheaper option, the Arctic tumblers, they're the same sort of double wall, vacuum insulated, stainless steel tumblers, but uh, Arctic, R-T-I-C, they are a, a cheaper alternative. And, and I've not, I don't own either. I've just seen, you know, see Yeti tumblers everywhere and just from what I can tell online, you can also get camo tumblers from Arctic, but they are the, like, your more traditional, um, I don't think it's actually, like, real tree camo, but it's, like, that kind of look, right? It's leaves and sticks, that kind of a, a look to it. 
But I don't know. There's just something about that old school camo Yeti tumbler that really caught my eye when I saw it the first time. So there's another idea. You guys got en- enough for another round of uh, gift ideas? Oh, yeah. I got enough for days. No. Wow. Um, my next one on my list. Um, this I'll go to since I went a little pricey on the first one. I'll go cheaper on this one. Um, a mobile SD card reader. Ah, yes. So something to check your trail cameras on your cell phone. Those are relatively inexpensive, but can be indispensable, especially if you travel any type of distance to get to your trail cameras and don't want to have to, you know, go all the way back to the house or whatever to check your. Yeah. Now, Jeff, cards. Do you have one of these readers for you? Because you you got an iPhone, right? Yeah, I have a reader. Yeah. Are they? Because I've read, I'm an I'm an Android guy. I've read different things about the iPhone readers being kind of persnickety. Do they have the right chip in them to where they work? Or have you experienced any? Or did you just buy something on Amazon? Or or I bought a cheap one off Amazon, like eleven bucks. Uh, and it the reader came. It's on an iPhone brand branded one. It it has an app that you can download and it it's it's a little persnickety but it it works fine it it does the job okay. you know sometimes it'll crash the reader will crash and you got to reopen it um but and actually they they have the brand i have i, I don't remember what it's called but they actually have two apps um and I think if one doesn't work for you, your phone, the other one does kind of thing. Oh, like it's okay. the exact same app, but two versions of it. I see. And yeah, I think it's so if one doesn't work for you, the other one will. OK, yeah, because like I said, I, I'm an Android guy and my experience has been the Android stuff is far less particular you know you you can just buy any sd card reader that plugs into your phone and it should work i've not heard any issues with with any of that because of that and because i'm not an iphone guy when i bought because i bought one i don't know if we all went in on that or whatever but we got one for dad and i went with the brand name i I think bone view whatever they're 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 a brand that sells sd card readers and just having that sort of, I don't know what, I guess I'll in air quotes, reputable brand behind it. I just felt more comfortable in that it would work giving it to somebody who is not techie and you know, he wouldn't have, if it didn't work or he couldn't follow the basic instructions and get it to work, he, you know, he wouldn't use it sort of thing. But so that's a, I like that idea. That's a good, that's a good idea for uh, definitely makes checking cards way way easier and you know you can check them right in the field and go hunt you know you can check your grab your card on the way to your stand and look at it on your phone while you're sitting in the stand sort of thing jeff you got another one that's got yeah. me in trouble though the checking it on the way to the stand because then i'm too busy looking at my phone and not hunting mm, yeah Good yeah point. that that definitely can get you in trouble because i've had that experience too where you, you pull the card while you're walking to the stand, sit down, start looking at the card, and then there's a deer standing in front of you, and your bow's on a hanger on the tree, and you're sitting there, you know, with a phone in your hand. Yeah. Or or you check it, and you don't have any pictures, and so you're like, well, this is a waste of time. And That's also burnt me. Because you, you're all excited about a spot and you're like, oh, I'm going to check this camera. I know it's going to be loaded. You pull it and there's nothing. It's real hard to sit there in the cold. It is. When there's nothing on the camera. But I, in those situations, I try to remind, like, I try to rely on my, my gut, right? Like, I picked this spot because I felt like it was a good spot. And all that 
not having pictures on my camera means is that the deer didn't walk in front of my camera. Maybe they were just out of range. Maybe they went behind it. Maybe they weren't coming from the direction I thought they were going to, you know, but, but it is hard, right? Where you, when you expect, I'm going to grab the card and go up there and I'm going to see deer after deer after deer and you got nothing. It's like, Oh, I'm wasting my time here. <laughs> right. Right. But, all right, Jeff, you're up. Yeah. Uh, kind of as a whole theme of gifts. Um, sometimes I think it's better to maybe spend more one year to get a really good gift than, you know, try to hit your price point every year of like $20 or whatever. Sure. sure. Um, cause when it comes to hunting, you know, sometimes you have things that just last forever. You know, our dad has one hunting knife. You know, it's a buck. What is it? 119. Is that the model number? Sounds right. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But he's had that knife forever. You know, it. Yep. he's only ever hunted with one hunting knife. And, you know, being able to give someone that gift, you know, something that they are going to use for the rest of their life and they can think about you every time is cool, you know, yeah. or maybe it's a trail camera, you know, hunters, you know, we spend a lot of time playing with our trail cameras and, you know, I, I know my wife 